Okay, in the last video we developed a concept of pressure and now we're going to get quantitative about it. We understood that as we increase in depth, pressure should increase. So this end what I've drawn here is just imagining a glass of water and I'm looking at a cube of water in the water. Now a good question to ask yourself is what's keeping the water from moving. After all, we can start to draw a free body diagram for the cube of water. And we know that there will be a force of gravity on my cube of water. So it has to be the case that the water underneath is pushing up on it. So we'll say that that's some sort of force F2. That will be due to the water pushing up. Um, and I say F2 just because I located this, I decreed this depth to be F2. However, um, it's also the case that the fluid above is pushing down, like so. We'll say that's F1. So we can put that into the free body diagram as well, F1. And then additionally, there will be some lateral forces due to the fluid as well. However, those lateral forces will cancel, so we're not too worried about them. So let's just go ahead and say F net equals MA. And since this is a static situation, the acceleration is zero. And then we'll take the Y component of that. So the only force we have acting up is our F2. And the forces we have acting down is the F1 from the fluid above pushing down and gravity. All right, so we can rewrite this as F2 equals F1 plus Fg. Now let's go and follow this through. This force is due to the pressure of the fluid at depth two. Remember that pressure is equal to the force of the fluid applied over the area. So we can rearrange this to say that F2 would be the pressure at depth two times the area of my cube, the area of the top of my cube, or for that matter, the bottom of my cube. Okay, and similarly, this would be equal to P1 times A and then this would be the mass of the fluid times g. Okay, but we can remember, I mean, this cube here is just a cube of fluid. From the definition of density, remember density was mass over volume. So the mass would be equal to density times the volume plus the density. Now what is the volume of this cube? Well, it would be this area A times this height H. And looky there, the areas all cancel. Um, and we are left with Pascal's law, which says the depth at pressure two is equal to the depth at pressure one plus rho G H. Now, already looking at this, rho gh, mgh, rho gh, mgh, um, it turns out that we can treat this, and we'll flesh this out more as we do Bernoulli's principle. Um, we can treat this as the potential energy per unit to volume. And so we can say this is the potential energy density. So potential energy per unit volume. We'll have to work at coming up with an interpretation for the pressure, but we can basically tie it into saying that it is the thermal energy per unit volume of the fluid. So this turns out, although we started by balancing forces, this does actually give us a relation between the energies of the fluid. So we take the potential energy of some chunk of fluid, divide through by its volume, that would be the potential energy density of that volume. We take the thermal energy, divide by some volume, that's related to the pressure. Okay. 
We can also use this to, if we know the pressure at some particular location, like here with our glass of water, we know at this depth right here um, that this is atmospheric pressure, right? So we could extend our cube all the way up to the surface and then make this depth here D. Um, if we do that, then we can rewrite this that the pressure at some lower depth would be equal to atmospheric pressure plus rho times g times the depth you are in the fluid. So this is particularly handy because we usually know what the pressure is at sea level. That's a good reference point for us. So then we can use that to figure out the hydrostatic pressures at other depths. This, by the way, also works going above sea level. Just your Ds will go negative and the density won't be the density of water anymore. It'll be the density of air. But let's just do a quick problem here. Um, let's just ask ourselves, let's say you are diving in the Great Lakes. I picked the Great Lakes because they're fresh water. So if you get a number that's different from what you've learned in a dive class, that's why. Um, but let's say you're diving in the Great Lakes. Um, Great Lakes are fresh water. I'm going to try to draw a mask and snorkel. This is not going to go well. All right, good enough. Um, I suppose you should have some arms too, huh? Okay. So I just want to know how far should I descend? Must I descend um, for the pressure to be equal to two atmospheres? Well, all right. We can go ahead and apply Pascal's law here. We can make we can say the pressure will be equal to atmospheric pressure plus rho g h. Sorry, um, rho g d here. Um, and we can solve for D. We can subtract atmospheric pressure from both sides. So rho G D equals P minus atmospheric pressure, um, what we'll call the gauge pressure in a moment. And then to get the required depth, I divide by rho and G. All right. Now here we've got to be a little careful. Um, we said that our target pressure is two atmospheres. And of course, atmospheric pressure is one atmosphere. Um, density of water is 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. And G is 9.8 Newtons per kilogram. Cancel, cancel there. All right, that all looks good, but don't just up and crank this into your calculator because at the moment you do not have matched units. Um, we need to get our atmosphere, our atmospheres into Pascals because then Pascals are Newtons per square meter and then everything will work out. So if you want, you can go ahead and say this is one ATM, but we still have to do the unit conversion. So remember, one ATM is 101,300 Pascals, and Pascals in Newton per square meter. And then here, if you want to multiply that out, that's 9,800 Newtons per cubic meter. Well, cancel, cancel. A Pascal is a Newton per square meter. Cancel, cancel, one over. Cancel, cancel all but one of those. You're left with one over, one over meters, which is meters. So yay, that's good. And you get that the depth is 10.3. So yeah, 10.3 meters. Um, which if that number seems big to you compared to what you may have learned in a diving course, uh, that would be because you probably learned at some ocean area the density of salt water is 
greater than a thousand kilograms per cubic meter, which is why you always have to make sure to have the right dive tables for where you're diving. Okay. So we can extend this a little more to talk about how to measure um, pressure. And there are two main classes of instruments that are used to uh, do that. One's a barometer. Barometers measure absolute pressure. So an example of a barometer would say be Torricelli's device. Now, Torricelli used mercury. This is definitely a do not try this at home kind of thing. He didn't know that mercury was scary, dangerous to work with, and wasn't using the appropriate PPE. Um, there are much better ways to build this, but I just want to talk about how it was done historically. So historically, the way Torricelli built his thermometer was basically had a bowl of mercury. But you could use any liquid you want just mercury happens to be very dense. And then he inverted a two test tube full of mercury, a very long one, into the bowl of mercury um, and let the level of the mercury settle. Now what he did here is he made a partial vacuum. In fact, it's a pretty darn good vacuum. So we can basically say the pressure up here is more or less zero. Um, yeah, there's a few random molecules moving around, but we don't need to get stressed out about that here. Um, then the pressure you're measuring, which often is the at atmospheric pressure, um, is uh, will be down here. So then this would be the depth of my fluid D. And so we can say from Pascal's law, P2 equals P1 plus rho G D but P1 is zero. So the pressure that the device measures will be equal to the density of the fluid GD. Like I say, in the early days of doing this kind of thing, um, mercury was the, a preferred choice because it's a metal that happens to be liquid at room temperature, and so it's absurdly dense, which means that the uh, required columns of fluid need not be very high. I mean, even so, 760 millimeters is kind of big, but it's at least something that you could mount up against a wall or something like that if you're measuring atmospheric pressures for weather re reporting. Nowadays, we know far better than to build it this way. There are other constructions that are, that are um, preferred. Um, so don't actually build one of these. This is a definite do not try this at home. Okay, the other big class of um, devices are what are called manometers. And manometers measure what's called gauge pressure. And this is because usually, unless you're doing weather reporting or something like that, you don't care about the absolute pressure. You care that the pressure inside something is greater or less than the pressure on the outside. So as an example here, you could say have a gas sample whose pressure you want to understand. So it'll be P2. But you only need to understand it relative to the surrounding environment. Um, so again, same deal. Now here, this end is open. Um, and so the pressure here, we'll say it's P1, um, there are, uh, which is usually one atmosphere, but there are applications in high vacuum systems where it's, ju it's just some other known pressure, but usually it's one atmosphere. And then what you do is you put in some sort of liquid, and depending on the application, it doesn't necessarily even have to be mercury. Water is a popular choice. Um, and the difference in these height, the, this here will be our height h. And again, we can apply Pascal's law to say P2 equals P1 plus rho g h. Um, but usually what you want to measure 
is just this, what we call the gauge pressure. Um, which would be P2 minus P1, and just say that's rho GH. So this measures the difference in the pressure inside versus outside. So you can see these, say, if you have a radon mitigation system installed in your basement, um, the, uh, that there will be a water-filled manometer. Usually the water is dyed blue to make it easier to see. And you just literally read that uh, difference in heights off on a scale um, to be able to tell the gauge pressure because all that cares, all you care about for the mitigation is that there is a difference in pressure inside and outside, not what the actual pressures are. And it turns out that you don't need a very large difference. So even though the density of water is a lot less than the density of mercury, for instance, water is more than fine enough in these sorts of devices. Okay. And so I'll just close out um, by giving one more example of um, Pascal's law here. Um, just, and that's the hydraulic lift. Um, when you see like a mechanic bring up a portable jack onto a car, um, it usually isn't just a simple little lever. What they've actually got is there is a mechanical lever to be sure um, they're applying some effort here, and then the you're push then the it's the effort's transmitted here, um, but that's just more for convenience for the mechanic. And then what happens is you push into a fluid-filled cell that's got a piston here and a piston here. Um, and the idea is that since Pascal's law tells us the only thing that matters for pressure is the depth, if I push down on this and increase the pressure here at this location, the pressure over here has to correspondingly increase. And so, say I can have a very large weight here, like, oh, a side of a car. Um, so it's a huge gravitational force, but if I spread that over a large area, as I push down on the lift over here, the pressure increases and that allows me to lift the car here. Now, you don't get something for nothing. Um, in order to lift the car a little bit, you're gonna to have to push the fluid down a lot a bit. But a lot of times for just doing things like changing tires and stuff like that, you only need to lift the car a little bit just to be able to get the tires off the ground. So that's how a hydraulic lift works. Okay, in the next series of videos, we will start taking a look at what happens when you let fluids move. Catch you on the flip side.